I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ken Zakaris. Ken, Ken's a chemical pathologist. And when I first got interested in low sugar in David Gillespie's book, um, Ken was one of the people I was pointed to. And over the last few years, we've given a number of talks together. Uh, we've given talks to the cardiologists at Epworth. We've given talks to the Association of Biochemists. We've given talks to the research group. We've given joint talks. Um, so, uh, and we've spent many hours tossing this around together. And uh, I think we have a consensus that on a number of levels, sugar is a problem and fructose is a problem. Ken has particular interests in diabetes. He's widely published in the medical literature. He's part of the Oz Diab study. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Ken. Look forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks, Rob. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honour to be here, and particularly talking after such inspirational speakers. Um, I'm not inspirational. I'm a sugar addict. Um, but, you know, I've come from, in my 20 or 30 year career, I've gone from working in a lipid clinic where my total focus was cholesterol to, over the last 20 years, realising that that's not working. This is not the answer. And so what is it that causes obesity and heart disease in so many Australians? And I'm going to give you a chemical pathologist view. I'm a nerdy molecular guy, I won't show you too many formulas, but this is my view of the world now. Life is just a series of chemical reactions to me, and the most important chemical reaction is harnessing the energy from the sun to convert carbon dioxide and water to carbohydrate. That is the thing that kicks off all virtually all life in Australia, carbohydrate. And it doesn't matter which branch of life you look at, whether it's bacteria, uh, primitive bacteria, or okay, or eukaryotes, which are animals and plants, all of them use glucose as a fuel. Even the bacteria that don't get oxygen, they live in volcanoes and you know, tar pits, use glucose as a fuel. So now what do, what do we do with glucose? Every human being manages glucose this way. We'll absorb that stuff from the plants and we'll have insulin to control how we use it. And you know what happens when we run out of insulin, it doesn't work. So, and what happens to that glucose? And what is fructose and how is it different? Well, there's one difference, an important difference between glucose and fructose, which I expect you all know, is that fructose is a hell of a lot sweeter than glucose. And we're attracted to it. If you had some fructose, which is a white powder, to me it's like a drug. Like that's as good as heroin to me. You put it on your tongue, it's just incredible stuff. Anyway, but I'm an addict. So now fruit has a lot of sugar. And it doesn't matter you know, if it's blackberries or strawberries or grapes, there's sugar in there. And that attractiveness of fructose and sweetness and the attractiveness of fruit is related. And plants put that fructose in their fruit so that animals will eat that fruit. So they'll, they'll develop a seed, encase it in a whole lot of fructose and glucose, and the animals will go and find that fructose and help to spread those seeds around. That's what the, and, and it doesn't really matter what type of animal, plants have found a way of attracting those animals to that fructose. Now, you have to also think of fruit in a, in a sort of evolutionary sense. We said sun is required what, to make sugar. So you make leaves in spring, in the summer when there's lots of sun, you store all that energy, energy for procreation, you make fruit. And that's when the animals come and they're really attracted by the fruit because the animals sort of also know that winter's coming up and we better eat as much as we can. So um, getting back to all of the sugars, um, cane sugar, which is the most common source of sugar in our diet today, is 50% glucose and 50% fructose. 
So we have to ask, this is a natural thing, what happens to the glucose and what happens to the fructose? Now, when you eat glucose, roughly 80% of the glucose you eat goes straight into your muscles, ready for energy. That's why athletes carb load, so they've got full of energy in their muscles. And a bit of it goes to the liver, and the liver can decide what to do. That. It can store it just for overnight. You might need a bit of sugar after you've been running around. But glucose, we know what to do with. We store it as glycogen in the liver and muscle. Fructose is completely different. Fructose cannot get into muscle. There's no way of it getting into muscle. It's only got one place to go, to the liver. And yes, it is true that the liver can convert fructose on to, by cutting it in half, the six carbons become three carbons, and then you can sort of rejoin the three carbons together and make glucose out of fructose. So it is possible to convert that fructose to glucose if you wanted to. And this is an example of, of a study where they gave radioactive um, glucose to um, people. And what they found is if you give fructose, you can make this three carbon glucose. But have a look here in that last column. If you give fructose and glucose, you don't make any of that fructose into glucose or hardly any of it. The combining the fructose and glucose makes sure that when fructose goes to the liver, you don't want to convert it to glucose because you've got plenty of glucose around it, because you've taken it with the glucose. So what will the liver do with it? What does the liver do with all this fructose and glucose? Part of the important part is you, because you're taking it with glucose, you're making insulin, and insulin tells the liver don't worry, there's plenty of glucose around. If you see any fructose, make it into fat. When you eat fructose and glucose, all the fructose becomes fat in the liver. And here's a study in some uh, mice fed fructose. This is their liver. Normally liver is dark and hard. And after a couple of weeks, there's some white dots appearing. That's fat stores. After four weeks, there's more fat, and by the time they've been fed fructose for a couple of months, their liver is full of fat. That's what fatty liver is in animals, and that's what fatty liver is in humans. If you eat fructose for months, you will have a fatty liver. So the liver makes it into fat, but you know, it can't sort of just keep storing all this fat, it'd explode. It has to do something with that fat. You're not going to burn it because you're eating tons of sugar. So now one of the things that's happening here, remember the insulin's being made, as long as you're eating sugar, you're pouring out insulin to try to control all of this sugar. And what ha now in type 1 diabetes, the thing that kills the cells that make insulin is your immune system. That's a whole other story. In type 2 diabetes, which is the diabetes that overweight people get, there's no destruction of the islet cells. They're just replaced with this hyaline tissue, which is just like rubbish. It's junk. You have burnt out the islet cells by thrashing them for months and months with all the sugar. And, and now, not only does the insulin doesn't work as well, but you can't make the stuff. You've run out of the islet cells. You've burnt out the islet cells. So things are getting pretty serious here because we're pouring out fat, we're running out of insulin, and the fat has to go somewhere. And one of the places it goes is out to your tissues, out to adipose tissue. That liver fat has to go somewhere, so you start making fat everywhere in your body particularly the places near the liver, like the um, a mental fat. But the other thing the fat is, it has to get out of the liver, it gets out of it by going into the blood. So your blood is full of fat, triglycerides. And fat in the blood, in simple terms, is what makes plaque, the blockage of the arteries. But, but we sort of knew um, from a while ago that it's certain type, the fat goes into the macrophages in the cell and accumulates and makes atheroma. Here is some human studies where they fed um, humans pure glucose for 10 weeks and you look at their fat levels and their triglycerides don't change. 
You can eat as much glucose as you want. The triglycerides don't change. But have a look when you're having fructose. The triglycerides, they double in within a month or two. And it's logical, if you stop eating the sugar, the triglycerides will halve in a month or two. But all that fat's going out into your blood. Now, in the old days, we used to think, you know, how, how do all this fat in the body and fat in the, in the bloodstream work? So we used to say, well, insulin doesn't work and we've got fat in the gut and the fat in the gut sends messages to the liver and the liver starts making stuff. That's, that's not true. The way we understand it now is that fructose is converted to fat and goes to the liver and the liver has to get, push that fat out and it pushes it out in a, in a particle we call VLDL cholesterol. It's a triglyceride particle in our blood. So our blood is full of the triglyceride particle. That's not the end of the story because you know cholesterol is good and bad. Let's have a look what happens to good and bad cholesterol when there's all this triglyceride particle there. The triglyceride particle will take cholesterol out of HDL and move triglyceride in it. There's a transport protein that just swaps it around. The end result of all this swapping around between HDL and triglyceride-rich particle is that HDL disappears. You lose your good cholesterol when there's this triglyceride-rich, the fat particle coming out of the liver. The second thing that happens is that the VLDL interacts with the bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, and it starts pulling out cholesterol ester, putting in triglyceride, but what you end up with is this small, hard VLDL particle. And that small, hard VLDL particle is no longer a useful thing for the body. The body doesn't know what to do with it. And, it, and small dense LDL, which you see when the triglycerides are high, when fat levels are high, small dense LDL is what gets into your blood vessels. LDL doesn't get into the blood vessels unless you've changed it in some serious way. And fat is the way to really change LDL into this um, very dangerous small dense LDL. So 30 years ago we used to say, oh, you know, you want to work out your fat lipid fats, if your cholesterol's high, you need to do something. That, any doctor that's practicing that medicine, just looking at the cholesterol level, is 30 years out of date. Now, you may have thought you were pretty clever saying good and bad cholesterol. That's 20 years out of date. We've known about that for 20 years, and that's not the whole story either. 10 years ago, we realised that if you change the LDL particle, which we call bad cholesterol, it's actually good. We need that LDL particle. We need cholesterol going around the body. We need it for lots of things, hormones, membranes. But if you change that particle in any way, by oxidising it, by adding sugar to it, or by making it small and dense, that's what causes heart disease. And so now, today, the way of thinking, the focus has shifted completely from cholesterol to triglyceride, because it's triglyceride what makes bad cholesterol really bad. Um, just one other aspect of laboratory tests which, which tells me how much fructose has changed our life is something called the hydrogen breath test. We give patients sugar, and normally sugar should be absorbed into the body, no problems. Um, but if it's not absorbed, we've got bacteria in our gut, and they love sugar. So this is what normally happens with the sugar called lactulose. You'll take the lactulose. Lactulose is a sugar nobody can absorb. So it just goes through the small intestine and about an hour or two later, because you didn't absorb it, the bacteria have a party. They've got all this sugar that they can metabolise and you're producing a tonne of hydrogen at one and a half to two hours time. So that's with an unnatural sugar. When you have fructose, normally what should happen is the fructose is absorbed by the small bowel. None of it gets to the large bowel, so there's no hydrogen production. That's the normal thing that happens with fructose. But in one in three um, hydrogen breath tests that we do, when they have fructose, this is what we see. Within half an hour, 
the bacteria are metabolising the fructose. There's two problems here. Why aren't they absorbing it? And what the hell are the bacteria doing in our upper gut? They were supposed to stay in our lower gut. And so this high fructose diet changes our bowel bacteria. They say, look, what the hell do we have to wait for that fructose to come down? It's coming by the bucketful. Let's go to the door and start eating this stuff. <laughs> and, this, and this syndrome of fructose intolerance and malabsorption for the last 30 years have been called irritable bowel syndrome. And we've said those people are crazy. And now we realise that, no, they weren't crazy. This is something society have done to them through this high fructose diet. And Peter Gibson, who is a professor at uh, Box Hill Hospital, is a world leader in this. And uh, we probably do more fructose hydrogen breath tests in Australia than any other country. And we know how bad it is, not only for your blood vessels and so on. So fructose. For glucose, glucose is part of the natural world and fructose is part of the natural world but only in late summer. In the modern world, fructose is not a late summer thing, a seasonal fruit. We have the fruit all year round. So one of the controllers for fructose is gone. We have fructose all year round, not just when the fruit's available. The second thing is fruit, you can't eat like 10 apples. Fibre will stop you eating 10 apples. But we've found a way around that. We'll just juice those apples and now we can have 10 apples in a glass of drink. Another restriction gone. Even when nature makes corn as glucose, we'll find a way to industrially convert that glucose to fructose. And that's what high fructose corn syrup is. So we've done everything possible to change the good sugar of glucose to the bad sugar of fructose and have it all year round. On top of that, and this is a separate issue, is this issue of vitamin D. Normally, at the end of summer, when you've had that fat, you've built up those fat stores, in the winter time, you don't want to use up those fat stores. There's no food around. You're going to live off those fat stores for winter. And the signal to your body to conserve its fat stores is that the vitamin D level has fallen. It's winter, it's dark. So now in modern society, vitamin D, we don't get out in the sun, it's dark all year round. And the message to our body all year round is conserve those fat stores. So everything's working the wrong way. We're making fat, we're conserving fat, we're just never burning it up. Better have a ketogenic diet if you want to burn it up. So, in conclusion, glucose is natural. Don't point at it as the problem. The body knows what to do with glucose. We've designed a system with a whole lot of hormones to make sure that glucose doesn't harm us and we can use it as a fuel. But fructose is there in nature to make us to make fat. And that fat and that change in sugar metabolism will burn out your pancreatic islet cells and give you diabetes. It will make you obese because that fat has to go somewhere and it'll change the blood fats in your blood so they end up in the blood vessels and block your vessels. And you know, other issues, there's a lot of other issues we could talk about, but, you know, other things you know, exacerbate that problem. So, you know, there's sort of a bit of truth in this um, forbidden fruit. You know, everything in moderation. You know, eat the things that you're supposed to. Don't bloody go berserk. Have them all. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Thanks.